Michael Fassbender is in the new Steve Jobs movie. Steve Jobs is not. Hi, Mikola here. This weekend, the Danny Boyle, Aaron Sorkin movie Steve Jobs opened in 60 theaters across the United States. Only 60. But that's up from just four theaters last weekend. This was my first chance to see the film. The showing I attended was packed. The movie's powerful. It shook me up. I really felt weird afterwards. Weird for hours. It was very disturbing, and I'm not sure why. Some of it, I think, is because it wasn't Steve Jobs that I saw on screen. It was Steve-ish. Fassbender may well get an Oscar for his work. But I knew Steve. I worked with Steve. And the guy in the movie just wasn't Steve. He was Uncanny Valley Steve. Now, as you may have heard, screenwriter Aaron Sorkin took loads of liberties with timelines and events. His goal was to make a drama, not a history. He wanted to craft an emotional and redemptive mythology for Steve. I don't have a problem with that. Especially since the filmmakers have been very open about it. They never claim to depict history. But rather they offer what Sorkin calls not a photograph, but a painting. There's no attempt to make Michael Fassbender look like Steve Jobs, or Seth Rogen look like Waz, or Jeff Daniels look like Scully. At no point can you forget you're watching movie stars. Director Danny Boyle explains, We wanted to send the signal very early on. It's clearly not a photographic impersonation. I think Kate Winslet, of all the actors, is the only one who entirely disappears into her role. She plays Joanna Hoffman. I remember thinking to myself as I watched the movie, wait, wait, I, I thought Kate Winslet was supposed to be in this movie. Where is she? Oh, oh, she's Joanna Hoffman. The crackling confrontations between Hoffman and Jobs are what drive the movie forward. She is his Jiminy Cricket, his Donna Noble. The boldest and smartest choice that Sorkin made was in leaving things out. Completely outside the frame of this movie, Steve marries and raises a family. Steve conquers Hollywood with Pixar. Steve transforms the music industry with iPod and iTunes. Steve changes how everyone does everything with iPhone. Steve rescues Disney animation by selling them Pixar so that John Lasseter and Ed Catmull can put the studio back on track. Steve falls ill. None of that happens in this movie. Steve Jobs is a much better movie for leaving all that out. There's no question that narrowing the scope makes the story better. Sorkin structures the film in three acts, each one taking place backstage before a key product introduction. Macintosh, Next, and iMac. It's a classic rom-com plot. Boy meets girl, boy loses girl, boy gets girl. Or in this case, boy founds company, boy loses company, boy gets company back. Fade out. The implausible but devilishly clever premise of Sorkin's structure is that Steve Jobs spends the final 30 minutes before each keynote warding off a series of random interruptions. They come from people in his life who have unfinished emotional business with him. In Sorkin's conceit, the only way people ever get to speak to Steve is to ambush him backstage at a product introduction. The moral center of the film, his strained relationship with his daughter Lisa and her mother, ex-girlfriend and high school sweetheart, Chris Ann Brennan. Steve at first refuses to acknowledge he's Lisa's father, although he does name a computer after her. He offers Chris Ann only minimal support despite his millions, and he does that only when ordered by the court. That's a part of Steve's life that most business biographies touch on only lightly, if at all. But Sorkin makes it the core of his script. Sorkin sees it as the most problematic aspect of Steve's life, although as with everything else, he fictionalizes and fudges it for dramatic impact. Some people who knew and worked with Steve are praising the movie, mainly the ones who are portrayed in the film. Others, including Apple's current leadership and Steve's widow, Lurleen Powell Jobs, are not at all happy with it, although it doesn't appear they've actually seen the film. I can't help but suspect that Andy and Waz and John and Chrisanne and Lisa all consulted with Sorkin in hopes of having one last conversation with Steve, an argument where their dialogue could be written by the great Aaron Sorkin. They could land a few good lines. I mean, think about the last fight you had with someone in your life, a lover, a parent, a boss, a colleague. Don't you wish you had Sorkin writing your repartee? Maybe that's why they like the film. There is conflict in the picture, but there are no villains. There's Steve's insistence on getting the product and the presentation right, precisely right, no matter the human cost. But it's not that he's serving his own ego, he's serving his vision and his drive to make a dent in the universe. Sorkin's choice to show Steve not in a lab or a boardroom or an office, except in brief flashbacks, but instead in a theater, three different theaters actually, underscores how much of Steve's genius was about presentation and stagecraft. And Danny Boyle, not only brilliant film director who gave us train spotting, 28 days later, slumdog millionaire, he's also the master of spectacle and theater, the national theater production of Frankenstein, and the opening ceremony of the 2012 Olympics. 
Boyle has great affinity for Steve's theatricality. In summary, Steve Jobs is a well-crafted drama, ingenious strategy, brilliant director, stunning performances, but it's not Steve. Here are some of the essential aspects of Steve Jobs that were missing in action or in very short supply. His joy, his humor, his warmth his almost giddy delight in springing a great product on the world. You'd think from watching this movie that the entire method Steve used to motivate people was to browbeat them and embarrass them. Okay, in truth, there was a good deal of that. He could make people feel awful for letting him down, awful. He could be ruthless about getting his way, but Steve's products and Steve's companies were not built on negative energy. They were built on his ability to inspire, to tell a story about the future, and to make you want to join in bringing that story to life. There's no one I ever met who could make you feel better about getting it right. But that Steve is barely in this movie. Sorkin and Boyle, writer and director, have been very open about the fact that they are telling a fictionalized version of Steve's story. I only worry that for most people, this film will become the historical record and the portrait of Steve Jobs that everyone remembers. Well, when the legend becomes fact, film the legend. Until next time, I'm Mikola. DVD extras. Act one of the film is the Macintosh introduction. I was part of the team that helped Steve stage that. Work I did for Apple in the early years was with an LA production company called Image Stream, run by Chris Carodi. We did big meetings for Apple, sales conferences, shareholder meetings, product introductions. I can remember occasions where Chris and I would propose ideas to Steve and he'd come right back at us with better ideas, much better ideas. It was his idea, for example, to open a sales conference with a parody of Ghostbusters called Bluebusters. IBM was known as Big Blue. And then he had the idea that before we go into Bluebusters, I should walk out on stage in a suit and white shirt and pretend to be from IBM and drone on for a while as if I'd stumbled into the wrong meeting and just annoy the audience. Until the VP of sales, Bill Campbell, got fed up and ordered me off stage. Why? He wanted to remind the sales force how lucky they were not to work for IBM. But he didn't have all the good ideas. We had a few. And when we had one, he knew it. I remember pitching an idea to Steve in two sentences and seeing him grin, nod, and say yes on the spot. So there was an upside to working with someone whose view of the world is binary. It helps you get out of the gray. It helps you get to the great. A few videos you might want to see. Here, this will be my account of the last video I made for Steve. It's a project that happened about nine years after Act 2, nine months before Act 3 of this movie. Here is Blue Busters. The idea that Steve pitched to us, he has a cameo in it. And here, 1944, an idea I pitched to Steve in two sentences, written by my friend Glenn Lambert, directed by Bud Schetzel, produced by Chris Carotti, and featuring another cameo by Steve Jobs as FDR. And there's a playlist of two of the three actual keynotes that framed the movie Steve Jobs. Couldn't find video of the next intro, so there's a substitute from a little bit later in the history of Next. Oh, and to borrow a phrase from Steve, one more thing. A link in the description to my account of the making of 1944. Maybe I'll make a video about that someday. Bye now.